everyone is here. Great. Um, so before we get started, does anybody have any questions about anything? That be no? I have no relevant questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. We, we can save the irrelevant questions for later then. But yeah, first to, to be business at hand, right? So um, for next time, we're just going to be finishing up the picture of Dorian Gray. And then we're going to be moving on to George Bernard Shaw uh, next week. Um, you will also have the first vocab quiz this weekend, right? So I'll post it on Friday morning and you'll have till Sunday at midnight to complete it. Um, all right, so um, let's get back into Oscar Wilde then. Um, so how did, this, uh, how did this middle part of the novel go for y'all? What'd you think? Um, Dorian is crazy. Okay. <laughs> all right, how, how so? Cra crazy is a kind of, uh, crazy can mean a lot of things. Well, he killed Basil. And okay. it seems like he doesn't feel bad at all, really, about um, Sybil's um, suicide. He seems just uh -huh. like, no, I don't want to think about it. Yeah. So, yeah, this section is bookended by two deaths, right? So we have, at the beginning of it, right, the suicide of Sybil Bain. of it, Dorian's murder of Basil Hallward. So let's start with Sybil's death as our kind of point of departure and look at ways in which that prepares us for Dorian's uh, eventual killing of Basil, right? So what, <clears throat> what did you notice about the circumstances surrounding Sybil's death and Dorian's response to it. It has a lot to do with vanity. Okay. With Dorian, not only his vanity within himself, but his the vanity that he looks for in objects. He wants something that's pretty, that's light, that's well wanted. And when she can no uh -huh. longer act or no longer desire to be successful at acting, she uh -huh. loses that glitter, that sense of vanity that he found attractive. Yeah. And once it's gone, she means nothing to him. And let's actually, let's look for a second at her name, right? Because in Victorian novels in particular, names are often in some sense symbolic, right? Sometimes, in like, like for example, in Dickens, they tend to be like really on the nose. Um, but <clears throat> let's just look at this name for a second, Sybil Vane, right? So the surname suggests vanity, right? But I would also suggest that it might also um, indicate something like a weather vane, right? Does, how does a weather vane work? It shows the way the wind blows. Yeah, it just moves whichever way the wind is blowing, right? It moves the way something external directs it, right? It's very flighty. It just goes where it's taken. Yeah, yeah. It's not self-directed. It's just moved by some other force, right? Good. And then if we take the name Sybil, what's a Sybil? Does anybody know? Isn't it an instrument? Or, no, I'm thinking of a symbol. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that would be something else, something quite different. Okay, so in Greek and Roman culture, right? There were basically two kinds of diviners, like, like people who tried to predict the future. On the one hand, you had soothsayers. All right, soothsayers were usually male. And they looked for patterns in nature, right? So they would look for, like, you know, patterns in the flight of birds um, or, um, you know, patterns in the entrails of a sacrificed sheep, things like that, right? And these patterns would then suggest to them the shape of the future. 
Now, the other kind of diviner was called an oracle or a sibyl. These were usually women. Actually, they were always women. And their method differed from that of the soothsayers, right? So if you wanted to be a soothsayer, your method was essentially logical, right? You know, you learned a series of, or essentially rational, right? You learned a set of patterns that were supposed to indicate particular things. And if you didn't see the pattern, it was bullshit, right? If you were a sibyl or an oracle, what you did was take a shit ton of magic mushrooms and then spout out whatever cryptic nonsense came into your head, right? And left it up to the um, left it up to the hearer to interpret. So a sibyl or an oracle predicts the future, but they do so in a way that is irrational. that's cryptic, that's couched in symbols. And I'm not really, I, I, I think that what we can see in Sybil Vane is a prediction of Dorian's embrace of irrationality. Um, as he descends further and further into a kind of debauched life, right? <clears throat> so let's start with his, let's, again, like go back to his responses to Sybil's death. And we'll see what we make of all this. Um, What is the first thing we note is strange about, like, say, when, you know, when Lord Henry comes to visit him, about the way he talks about Sybil's death? talks about making it up to her, right? And then he doesn't know yet that she's died. I think it's also important to note how she's died, too. What has she done? How has she killed herself? Poison. Yeah. Specifically, she's taken prussic acid, which is, um, it's a chemical that um, was used in 19th century stage makeup. So in some sense, she, she uses the tools of her art, right? The art that she has rejected, but that Dorian lo loved her for, um, in order to take her own life. All right, if you look on page 84 here, right, when uh, Lord Henry is telling him about what's happened, right? Uh, bottom of the page, last paragraph here. I have no doubt it was not an accident, Dorian, though it must be put in that way to the public. It seems that as she was leaving the theater with her mother about half past 12 or so, she said she had forgotten something upstairs. They waited some time for her, but she did not come down again. They ultimately found her lying dead on the floor of her dressing room. She had swallowed something by mistake, something, some dreadful thing they use in theaters. I don't know what it was, but it had either prussic acid or white lead in it. I should fancy it was pr prussic acid as she seemed to have died instantaneously. Harry, Harry, it is terrible, cried the lad. Yes, it is very tragic, of course, but you must not get yourself mixed up in it. I see by the standard that she was 17. I should have thought she was almost younger than that. She looked at such a child and seemed to know so little about acting. Dorian, you mustn't let this thing get on your nerves. You must come and dine with me. 
and afterwards we will look in at the opera. It is a patty night, and everybody will be there. You can come to my sister's box. She has got some smart women with her, right? So, in addition to informing Dorian about Sybil's death and the means of it, what else does Lord Henry tell him? To move on. Yeah. He's like, there's smarter women. She wasn't that smart. She wasn't very experienced. She knew nothing. Yeah. She was nothing. Come out with me and have a good time, right? We'll go to the opera. We're going to go hear Adelina Patti sing, right? Now, Patti, whose uh, music you, you were hearing as we started class, uh, was an Italian soprano. Who was noted in particular for her technique and for her vocal control. And at the time um, the novel was this novel was published, um, she's already she was already well advanced in her career. She was about 50 years old, so not a young woman. And she also, you know, lived, you know, a kind of semi-scandalous kind of life, you know, three marriages and several affairs, right? Um, all very much publicly talked about. So of interest to the novel, not just because she provides, a, you know, like a real historical figure in the background here, but also because she provides um, some <clears throat> some indication of a combination of forces that I kind of want to talk about today that are present in the novel and in late 19th century culture kind of more generally, right? So in someone like Adelina Patti with um, you know, her great artistry and slightly scandalous life, we have the combination of what Friedrich Nietzsche called the Apollonian and the Dionysian poles of art. Has anybody heard these terms before? Is anybody familiar with this at all? Kathy, you're nodding. Does this sound a little familiar? A little bit. Not okay. Exactly so these are first mentioned in Nietzsche's essay, The Birth of Tragedy. And these are the two poles, he argues, on which Greek tragedy is built, right? So Apollonian, of course, relates to the god Apollo, who is the god of poetry, of light, of medicine, and of reason. So Apollo contributes to the tragedy its very regular poetic form. The, kind of the, the very kind of regular music of the chant and all that kind of thing, right? All the parts of it that are dependent on organizing feeling into some kind of coherent body, right? What about Dionysus? What do you all know about the god Dionysus, if anything? Um, god of vineyards, wine, uh -huh. parties. Um, yep. He was kind of the, the bad child. Yeah, yeah. Dionysus is the god that the rational spotlight Greeks were a little afraid of, right? And they usually kept his image outside the city, except for you know one weekend a year, right? So yeah, he's the god of wine and all of the emotions that are attendant upon consuming too much wine, right? So he's a god largely of kind of like irrationality and frenzy. And Dionysus is responsible for the emotional catharsis that one goes through in watching a tragedy play out, right? 
And there are references to this notion of Dionysian irrationality kind of throughout this part of the novel. Right? So for example, we're looking at the portrait gallery in Dorian's uh, country home. There's a picture of his mother, if we look on page 122. And at uh, the bottom of the first, um, <clears throat> first paragraph here, can I get somebody to read, uh, starting with, and his mother with her Lady Hamilton face? And his mother with her Lady Hamilton face and her moist, wine dashed lips. He knew what he had got from her. He had got from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others. She laughed at him in her loose, freshman dress. There were vine leaves in her hair, the purple spilled from the cup she was holding. The carnations of the paintings had withered, but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of color. They seemed to follow him wherever he went. So, uh, Bacant, right? The, uh, Bacante. These were female followers of Bacchus. Which is the Roman name, uh, the Latin name for Dionysus. So his mother here is presented in the dress, right, of one of these wild women who chases after the god of wine. And this is in a portrait gallery full of his forebears, all of whom are described as being kind of like in some way wild or degenerate, right? That there seems to be something in the family, something genetic, something inheritable, that seems to make people go bad. And this is something that I kind of want to put up against the idea of Lord Henry's influence on Dorian, right? Whether Lord Henry really does influence Dorian, or whether there's something already in Dorian that causes him to wander down a darker path, right? What do y'all think? I mean, there's a live iron marker. It was what he was killing, Basil. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like it. Each of us has heaven and hell in him. Uh-huh. Uh, and to me, that means, like, it, he could have gone either way. Like, Dorian, yeah, he has, like, all these wild people behind him. Uh-huh. But at the beginning of it all, he seemed pretty okay. But then he met uh, Harry, and he was just kind of like, just immediately took a left turn. Uh huh. So I feel like it's not saying like because your family is bad, you're going to be bad too. Okay. It's like you have the choice to act upon whichever. Uh huh. Yeah, go ahead, Bree. Um, I'm not sure if this is very relevant, but uh -huh. reading it, it kind of reminds me of something that I read in another class with Dr. Brian, the Marvel okay. Fawn. Okay, that's in, Hawthorne, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a lot of our main character in that story as well, where that person originally presents as very innocent and beautiful and is slowly corrupted over time throughout the novel. Uh -huh. And I kind of see the same thing happening here. And like the line that um, you said just a minute ago, I think he could have gone either way. But something, you know, looking at, you know, the lineage and what he came from, it makes me uh -huh. wonder, why was he not already heading that direction for him? Okay. What was the difference with him that made it take longer for him to get to that wild and degenerate uh -huh. point? What's and, missing? And I'm, I'm just going to play advocate for the already in Dorian position for a minute here, right? Um, in that... Um, some of his behavior when he comes to see Basil in that first in that second chapter, right, is a little bit brattish and immature. 
right? You know, he, he, he gets sulky when uh, Basil doesn't want to do, won't do what he wants, right? And um, he also mentions that he's supposed to do this charity concert uh, with, um, ba with Basil's aunt, right? Or was with Harry's aunt, one of their aunts, right? And he's just kind of blown it off, right? So I think there is at least a kind of like, there is a carelessness and a selfishness in him. I think even before Harry gets his hooks into him, right? I think he just needed a little nudge in the direction. <laughs> if he was going to okay. go the other way, it would have taken a bigger push or shove from okay. Basil. But I think that beauty is a very blinding mask, and he wore it well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, everybody talks about Dorian's personality, right? It's like, with your personality, you could have the world at your feet. But what does Dorian's personality really consist of? Why do people admire him? They admire him because he's beautiful. It's not really the, the personality that they're looking at. Uh -huh. They're blinded by the look on his face. He looks innocent and pure, so he must be that way. I mean, even if we look at some of the, the conversation he has with Basil, right? After Sybil has died. Right. <clears throat> so, there are two very different uh, encounters here. Right? First, with Harry, where Harry just encourages him to go to the opera and submerge his sorrows in beautiful things. And then there is another conversation with Basil in which he tells Basil he can't sit for him again, right? If we look on page 97, uh, bottom of the page, right, Basil makes this long speech where he gives, uh, gives up his secret, right? Can I get somebody to start reading that for us from, um, I see you did, don't speak. I see you did, don't speak. Wait till you hear what I have to say. Dorian, from the moment I met you, your personality had the most extraordinary influence over me. I was dominated, soul, brain, and power by you. You became to me the visible incarnation of that unseen ideal whose memory haunts this artist like an exquisite dream. I worshipped you. I grew jealous of everyone to whom you spoke. I wanted to have you all to myself. I was only happy when I was with you. When you were away from me, you were still present in my art. Of course, I never let you know anything about this. It would have been impossible. You would not have understood it. I hardly understood it myself. I only knew that I had seen perfection face to face and that the world had become wonderful to my eyes. Too wonderful, perhaps. For in such mad worships there is peril. The peril of losing them, no less than the peril of keeping them. Okay, we can pause here for a second, right? So what's the confession here that Basil is making to Dorian? That he was overwhelmed by the beauty. Yeah, and that he seems to associate Dorian's beauty with some kind of ideal, right? So one of Wilde's favorite poets was John Keats. And are any of you uh, familiar at all with Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn? Yes. So anyway, uh, those of you who know it, you remember what like, the last two lines of that poem are? I remember reading it for your class. Okay. Remember <laughs> you remember that I made you read it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the poem describes a series of still painted scenes on an urn, right? And there's a kind of poignant sadness to much of it because these are all actions that will never be finished, right? Things that will never be fulfilled, right? So, you know, the lover is never going to kiss his beloved. The people who have left the town are never going to return to it, right? The flute player is stuck playing the same 
silent song for as long as the urn lasts, right? So it's kind of like about the, you know, the, the joy, the kind of mixed joy and sadness of something being frozen in eternity, which I think is actually kind of relevant to a lot of what's going on in the novel generally. But the last two lines of the poem are, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all you know and all you ever need to know. So this equation of beauty and truth, right? Can we relate that to anything that we talked about last time? back to our discussion last class, particularly towards the end of the session. Anything that seemed to play on this relationship between beauty and truth. perception, yeah. like kind of like what you're seeing at the moment. And that might be who you are right now with this particular group of people. But yeah, that that beautiful mask might hide, you know, as Basil puts it when he sees, you know, what's become of his portrait, right? The face of a satyr, right? So the relationship here between beauty and truth is a little bit more strained. Um, now, what about when we talked about the, this idea of platonic love last time? What was the gist of that? Y'all remember? love of the beautiful body can lead one to love of the truth, right? Mm -hmm. So you begin by loving beautiful things or beautiful people. And loving those beautiful things or people can lead you to love of higher spiritual, the higher spiritual things that um, those beautiful objects or beings are merely representations of. And I think that's part of what Basil is expressing here as well, right? Now, there's also something um, a little bit um, kinkier and more underhanded going on on the surface here as well that is very much in the late, 18, the late 19th century waters, right? So Wilde would have been familiar 
with two books written around the same time by people who were in his own circle of Oxford graduates and dons, right? So the first is a book by John Pentland Mahaffey. called Social Life in Greece from Homer to Menander. And this was published in 1874. So what Mahaffey pointed out was a certain tendency in elite Athenian culture, so the kinds of circles in which people like Plato moved, right? Um, towards these pedagogical and sensual relationships between um, an adult man and a male adolescent, um, which become known as, in, you know, in future days, as pedagogical pederasty. Right? The idea was that the older man, through his admiration of the younger man's beauty, was supposed to you know, bring him up into um, knowledge of uh, Greek social conventions and mores, right, you know, to, they said there was supposed to be kind of educational purpose to the older man's um, admiration of the younger man, right? These relationships were not necessarily sexual, but often were. And Mahaffey kind of dances around the subject a lot. It's kind of clear what he's hinting at, but um, he doesn't quite uh, spell it all out. Now, written around the same time, actually written slightly before, but suppressed initially was a book by John Addington Simons called A Problem in Greek Ethics. So it's written in 1873 but not published until 1883. And Simons is a lot more clear about what's go what was going on, and um, a lot more kind of approving in tone than Mahaffey was. So <clears throat> an admiration like both Lord Henry and Basil have for Dorian, right? See, it seems to be built on this same kind of model. Although there's no, um, at least in the, ver the 1891 version of the novel, which is what we're reading, um, there's no net, there isn't as much hint of sexual feeling on Lord Henry's part as there is potentially on Basil's, right? Lord Henry, like, what's Lord, let, let's kind of step back for a second and examine Lord Henry a little bit more closely. Like, what do y'all make of this guy thus far? What is he like? Egotistical. Okay, why would you say he's egotistical, Nick? Because he's overtly decadent. Okay, yeah, overtly decadent, I think, is a good way to put it. But what's overtly decadent about him? He's entirely selfish. He preaches that he's selfish because he is what matters in the world. Okay. He's kind of, he's like a know-it-all, like he just thinks he knows, like everything about the world, like uh -huh. he's right, like his views are right, and, but that's all right. Yeah, and sometimes uh, he's kind of also kind of knowingly full of shit, right? Like there's a, the, the dinner party uh, in the first part of the novel that we read, uh, let's turn to that for a second. 
you know, where he is uh, dazzling <coughs> the uh, other guests at the party on page 38. Right? He played with the idea and grew willful, tossed it into the air and transformed it, let it escape and recaptured it, made it iridescent with fancy and winged it with paradox. The praise of folly as he went on soared into a philosophy and philosophy herself became young and catching the mad music of pleasure, wearing, one might fancy, her wine-stained robe and wreath of ivy, danced like a bacante over the hills of life and mocked the slow silliness for being sober. So, how seriously or deeply does Lord Henry believe anything that he says? I don't think he really believes in it at all. He views himself as a puppet master, and he believes that he can say whatever he wants to say, uh -huh. and everyone will believe it because he has created this persona in which mm -hmm. everyone thinks that he is the end all be all. Yeah, he and believes that he is the authority on all things, and he can uh -huh. play puppet master like he is Dorian throughout sure. the entire novel. Uh huh. Although, do, does even Lord Henry, as far as we can tell, know Dorian's secrets? He thinks he does, but he doesn't. Yeah, there are th there are things about Dorian that he doesn't know as well, right? He likes and, to think that he knows everything. Yeah, and all of it is just kind of a game to him, right? He's bored and decides to toying with other people. How is going to himself? Bored, I think, is a good way to put it. Yeah. There's, um, you know, I don't know, we talked a little bit about uh, Charles Baudelaire last time, right? And um, the poem that opens Baudelaire's Flowers of Evil to the reader um, notes that the supreme decadent emotion is boredom, right? Boredom is our only motivation for doing anything, right? We do all, you know, you know, a decadent, according to the poem, does all of these twisted, immoral things just to try to make themselves feel something because they're so bloody sick of it all, right? And I think that there is something of that philosophy running through much of this, but not expressed quite so honestly or... Um, so pessimistically. Right? On the one hand, we have Lord Henry kind of refusing to dwell on Sybil's death, right? But we also have Dorian telling Basil that he does not, that he can't, on page, uh, page 94, right? I cannot repeat an emotion. He doesn't want to feel anything that he's already felt before. Everything has to be new. And I think that if we... Um, there's, actually, there's a good sentence on that same page. We look further down page 94. Um, Dorian is kind of giving Basil his philosophy of art, right? He says, to become the spectator of one's own life, as Harry says, is to escape the suffering of life. Let's sit with that for a minute. Andrew, think about, like, what do you think that means, right? To become the spectator of one's own life. It kind of takes me back to some of the things that we discussed on the first day of class. Okay. With, you know, kind of like the feeling of nothing has any inherent meaning and that okay. life has no meaning. And this is kind of like, I remember we talked about you can either accept it or try to fight it. And I think that plays more to the acceptance of it 
and okay. a way to cope with the fact that nothing has meaning, so you have to toy with things, pretend that you do have meaning. Okay, so you're thinking back to like like some of the, the Nietzsche stuff, right? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Although I think that, that Nietzsche would not have um, argued for kind of like standing back and watching your own life happen. It's like, okay, if nothing means anything, right, then what you have to do is go out and make meaning of some kind, right? You know, through your own force of will. Yeah, Kathy? I was gonna say, I think it means like, when you're too close to something, you don't realize what's going on. And you okay. can't see a bigger picture. And so if you're a spectator of your own life, then you finally understand like what's going on with your own life because uh -huh. you're so involved in your life. Okay. You don't see it until you take a step back and reflect on what's happened. Okay. But are they really reflecting here? Is Dorian really reflecting on his own life or is he trying to avoid reflecting on his actions? I don't know, what do y'all think? Because most of what we see from Dorian is as it gets progressively worse and he becomes more and more corrupt, he's trying to separate himself from everything in an attempt to avoid facing what the reality uh -huh. is. Because as the painting of him, his portrait becomes more and more deteriorated, he hides it, he covers it, he locks it away, and the one time we see him show it to somebody, he murders them because he can't let it out. He can't let that out and face what he has become or what he's done. Uh -huh. And I think what, like, we can kind of go back here to Lord Henry for a second, right? And if we look at like you know, the way Lord Henry approaches every situation, right? It's with something like disinterested contemplation, right? No emotional involvements. You stand back and you look at something, you know, whether it's a person or a picture or a dinner party, right? Like it's a piece of art that you are seeking um, to, you know, to appreciate aesthetically, right? So all he does is stand back and watch, right? With something like detached amusement. So do, does Lord Henry ever really seem to feel anything? Other than amusement, though. Yeah, apart from boredom and amusement, yeah. And does he even seem to act on his own principles? Or are they just pretty words to entertain dinner party guests? Kind of like one of those like billboards or like signs you see when you go somewhere like a tourist attraction that just spouts out the information. Okay. He just kind of stands there to the side, spouting out all of these things that sound pretty. Uh huh. And then disappears. He fades back and just watches everything take place. Uh huh. Yeah, stand, yep, standing back with a languid smile, smoking an opium tainted cigarette. He just seems like a puppet master of sorts to me. Uh -huh. Every time I think about him, that's just what I go to because that's what he does. He like stirs the pot, he interjects here and there, mm -hmm. and then watches everything happen. So let's, um, for a second here, back to the civil vein thing. So we've already kind of established, right, that what Dorian loved most about Sybil was her ability to inhabit other personalities, right? not her own personality necessarily. Now, once 
she has died. Or when, like even before he knows she's dead, right? He notices something problematic in his picture, right? An expression of cruelty that hadn't been there before. If we look on page 82, as he often remembered afterwards, and always with no small wonder, he found himself at first gazing at the portrait with a feeling of almost scientific interest. That such a change should have taken place was incredible to him. And yet it was a fact. Was there some subtle affinity between the chemical atoms that shaped themselves into form and color on the canvas and the soul that was within him? Could it be that what that soul thought they realized, that what it dreamed they made true? Or was there some other more terrible reason? He shuddered and felt afraid. And going back to the couch, lay there, gazing at the picture and sickened. What do you make of this paragraph? What's he trying to do in his contemplation of the picture? He's trying to rationalize it. Okay, yeah. He's trying to come up with some rational explanation as to why this has happened, right? He approaches with almost scientific interest, right? The same kind of interest with which Lord Henry approaches anything, right? The kind of disinterested, um, <clears throat> detached observational methods of a scientist, right? And what does what is, what is the passage suggest? Was there some subtle affinity between the chemical atoms that shaped themselves into form and color on the canvas and the soul that was within him? I mean, ultimately, what is a picture? A reflection? Wait. <laughs> if we just break it down to its simplest material parts and essence, right? What is a, what is a painting? Okay, yeah, we're breaking it down as far as we can, right? Maybe slightly less broken down. Pigment. Yeah, it's just pigment on a canvas, right? And pigment on a canvas can respond to chemical reactions in its environment. It can respond to light. It can respond to damp, right? It can respond to action from environmental forces, but what can it typically not respond to? Emotion. Yeah. A picture doesn't care how you feel about it, right? How many of you are familiar with the old Greek myth of Pygmalion? Okay, <laughs> so Pygmalion is a misogynist who makes a beautiful marble statue of the goddess Venus. And he falls deeply in, like, he's, he's cursed by the goddess for having rejected love to fall deeply in love with this statue, right? This thing that cannot return his affection. And so he spends days, hours, you know, um, caressing the statue and, you know, draping it with pretty things and giving it gifts, right? But until he finally repents of his original position, the statue cannot love him back, right? And this is how we typically think about our relationship to inanimate objects, right? they don't respond to our emotions or to our actions unless we do something like, you know, unless we try to do something directly to them, right? So, by thinking of what's happening to the painting as a chemical process, what does this 
suggest about the way Dorian is thinking about his own soul, the activity of his own soul? Chemical process in the brain. Yeah. That there's some kind of material connection between the activity of the soul and these pigments on a canvas. So what we have here is a kind of expression of a sort of materialist philosophy. Really all that matters is matter. Here is, who is also fascinated by transformation, right? The only thing he's not interested in seeing transform is himself. Right? Otherwise, he is, you know, he's constantly seeking after new experience, novel experience, right? Things that haven't happened to him or to anyone else before. And he couldn't love Sybil Vane anymore when she insisted on just being Sybil Vane. Now let's try and relate this to what he what happens between him and Basil. Why does he kill Basil? Because Basil has seen the truth. He's seen what's behind the facet, the mask or the mm -hmm. essay that he puts up. Okay. Do we think it's just because Basil has seen the truth that he, that he feels he has to kill him? Also because Basil makes him feel something he doesn't want to feel. He's running away from feeling an emotion that he's either already felt or has no desire to feel. Okay. There is another thing that I just want to point us all to here for a second. We look on page 131, as Basil is inspecting Dorian's painting. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph that starts with an exclamation of horror broke from the painter's lips? An exclamation of horror broke from the painter's lips as he saw it in the dim light of the hideous face on the canvas grinning at him. There was something in his expression that filled him with disgust and loathing. Good heavens, it was Dorian Gray's own face that he was looking at. The horror, whatever it was, had not yet entirely spoiled that marvelous beauty. There was still some gold in the thinning hair and some scarlet on the sinful mouth. The sodden eyes had kept something of the loveliness of their blue. The noble curves had not yet completely passed away from chiseled nostrils and from the plastic throat. Yes, it was Dorian himself. But who had done it? He seemed to recognize his own brushwork, and the frame was his own design. The idea was monstrous, yet he felt afraid. He seized the lighted candle and held it to the picture. In the left-hand corner was his own name, traced in long letters of bright vermilion. So, what's the most horrifying thing do you think for Basil in inspecting the picture? Not his signature is on it. Yeah, he made this, right? And. <clears throat> His own name is traced in long letters of bright vermilion. Y'all know what vermilion is? It's like a shade of blue, right? It's actually a shade of red. Oh. Yeah, vermilion is a shade of red. And the color red pops up again and again in this chapter, right? or different shades of red. Right? On page 133, as Basil is encouraging Dorian to repent, right? he says, it is never too late, Dorian. Let us kneel down and try if we cannot remember a prayer. Isn't there a verse somewhere, though your sins be as scarlet, yet I will make them white as snow? But whose sin here is scarlet in the painting? Basil's. It's his name that's there in red, right? And 
then, after the murder is done, page 134, the thing was still seated in the chair, straining over the table with bowed head and humped back and long, fantastic arms. Had it not been for the red, jagged tear in the neck and the clotted black pool that was slowly widening on the table, one would have said that the man was simply asleep. How quickly it had all been done. He felt strangely calm and, walking over to the window, opened it and stepped out on the balcony. The wind had blown the fog away, and the sky was like a monstrous peacock's tail, starred with myriads of golden eyes. He looked down and saw the policeman going his rounds and flashing the long beam of his lantern in the doors of the silent houses. The crimson spot of a prowling hansom gleamed at the corner and then vanished. A woman in a fluttering shawl was creeping slowly by the railing, staggering as she went. Now and then, she stopped and peered back. Once she began to sing in a hoarse voice. The policeman strolled over and said something to her. She stumbled away, laughing. A bitter blast swept across the square. The gas lamps flickered and became blue, and the leafless trees shook their black iron branches to and fro. He shivered and went back, closing the window behind. And on the next page, he notes that some red star had come too close to Earth, right? There had been a madness of murder in the air. So we tend to associate the color red, and especially the shade crimson, right, or scarlet, with blood and with anger and with violence, right? Yeah, what were we going to say? Uh, I just had a thought. Uh-huh. Um, we're talking about sins and how... Basil's name's on the painting, therefore the sin would be his. Mm -hmm. And he is the one that ends up dying for the sins, but he didn't really commit the sins. Well, and did he or did he? He did, in a way. <laughs> what, do, but, what, what do you all think Basil's sin here might be? Well, he is the whole reason that Lord Henry and Dorian met each other. Okay, by allowing Henry to influence Dorian, maybe, right? He also created the painting, and he inspired the beauty and encouraged the fascination with it. Yes, exactly. So he died for the ultimate sin of putting value or faith in mm -hmm. beauty as a personality. Yeah, and one of the things that Dorian accuses him of earlier after Sybil Vane's death, right, is that you only taught me to be vain, right? So Basil, by making this beautiful painting of Dorian, right, and showing him, I guess, for the first time what he really looked like in a kind of idealized form, creates the monster Dorian becomes. So yeah, this is, on a certain level, Basil's sin. You had a hand up a second ago, Sam. What were you going to say? I was going to say it's someone idolizing. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, when he's painting Dorian, he's literally got him up on a pedestal, right? Like he like even called like the painting like his masterpiece. <laughs> like, so weird. Yeah, and this masterpiece is hidden away where no one can see it, right? At the top of Dorian's house in his old school room. I think that there is something kind of importantly symbolic about the childhood school room being a place where the, the portrait that gets older and older and older is locked away. But I'm not sure exactly what that is. Then you okay. also have the school mom or the teacher that is older and represents the older wisdom. So you have that combination of the youth and the older wisdom, which the painting kind of embodies itself okay. as it's a representation of the loss of youth. And also children are usually seen as like innocence. Okay. And the painting isn't even fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, Dorian himself is the physical representation of continual innocence, right? Well, yeah, the painting suffers for all of his sins. The painting takes on all of the ugliness that he lives, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, going off of that with him being a representation of innocence in the painting, you know, showing the effects of the corruptness or whatnot, mm -hmm. a lot of times the actions of a child or the way they behave is reflective of, or seen as reflected upon the parents or the teachers. This okay. child or acts out, I see a lot because my grandmother works in the school system, sure. a child acts out, you have a parent conference meeting, it reflects on the parenting and the way the child was raised. Mm -hmm. So could that be a connection there between his representation of innocence but the continual like degrading of the painting that represents the older? Like yeah. as a reflection on the teacher with the schoolroom? I, yeah, let's let's so, so think of think back to a minute. Like, do we all recall what Dorian's family background is? Apart from the fact that he is, you know, a, a wealthy young gentleman uh, of apparently aristocratic lineage. His mom died in a, in a year of his birth. Yeah. Um, so he never knew his, his mother. His dad was killed or duel. Yep. And were his parents of the same social class? Not at all. Yeah, so he's the product of a cross-class marriage, right? And apparently his grandfather, right, this Lord Kelso, is acknowledged by all and sundry, right, not only to have arranged the death of his unwanted son-in-law, but also to have been kind of a, kind of a piece of shit overall. and an embarrassment um, to other English people to whatever place he happened to be. Um, we also know that, that you know, apparently Lord Kelso uh, kind of did what he had to in raising Dorian, but like that he grew up and he like, grew up without love, right? So yeah, cross-class marriage and a loveless home environment. which again kind of moves us further and further away, right, from the idea that, at the very least, that the only thing poisoning Dorian's personality is Lord Henry's influence, right? There's this family background of debauchery. Um, there is, you know, the, the early death of his mother, right, and the unpleasant relationship with his grandfather as well, right? In addition to Basil's painting teaching him self-worship and vanity, right? So there is one more thing that I just want to cover quickly today and then I'll let you all go. Um, what did you all make about The stuff regarding the yellow book that Lord Henry gives him. Um, Dorian's obviously pretty like captivated by um, this book at uh -huh. first, not really, and then he really gets into the book, and it kind of like. Uh, kind of follows it to like what he wants to do with life. Yeah, he really lets the book influence him, yeah. right? And he tries to model himself on the main character, right? So there's a significance in the color yellow here. And the yellow was the primary, like was, was the, the favorite color of the decadent movie. Um, now here's why. Right? So this book is new, right? The pages are still pretty white. In a couple of years, what color are they going to be? 
They're going to be yellow. Yeah, exactly. Okay, things yellow with age. So yellow is the color of decadence because white is the color of purity. And yellow is what you get when white decays. But yeah, the book, um, right, which you know Dorian himself calls poisonous, right? Um, <clears throat> scholars have tried to locate an actual book that this was based on. The usual candidate is a, no a novel by the Belgian writer J.K. Hoismans. called Au Rebours, which is something that apparently doesn't translate directly um, into, uh, into English. So you will usually see it in English as something like against the grain. And it's chapter by chapter kind of like detailing the life of a Parisian aristocrat who goes out to a house in the country and kind of in each chapter um, obsesses over some new sensory or aesthetic pleasure until finally at the end having exhausted every possible form of pleasure he decides to return to Paris and um, actually live So this book um, is big with the 1890s decadent crowd. In fact, so um, and is yeah is probably the book that Lord Henry's yellow book here is based on, right? But. <clears throat> This is kind of where I want to pick it up next time, too. Um, I want to note kind of at the beginning of chapter 11, right, how, just how fixated Dorian becomes on this book, right? For years, Dorian could not free himself from the influence of this book, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he never sought to free himself from it. He procured from Paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition, and had them bound in different colors, so they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over which he seemed, at times, to have almost entirely lost control. The hero, the wonderful young Parisian in whom the romantic and the scientific temperaments were so strangely blended, became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself. And indeed, the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life written before he had, written before he had lived it. So, I want to start next time, we're out of time for today, by looking at all the different copies of this book he acquires and what this tells us in part about how weird the publishing and book buying culture of the late 19th century was. Um, and then we'll move on to discussing the end of the novel. So does anybody have any questions about anything? Yeah, Hannah. Um, the vocabulary quiz, is that just like on George View, like on quizzes? Yeah, it'll be on George View, it'll be under quizzes, um, and um, I, will let, I, I will let you know when it's opened, and I will also send people a reminder on Sunday to make sure they're going to take it. Okay. Um, I have one more. I'm yeah. not going to be here Thursday. Are the recordings all George View? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there, there is a, a folder on George View labeled lecture videos, and they will, always, they will always be posted there, usually the day after class. All right, so let me give you the guide questions for next time. <clears throat>